Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm calling this meeting to order of Cleveland Heights City Council. It is uh, March 4th, 7.30 p.m., or pretty close to it. Uh, Eddie, would you call the roll, please? Uh, Boyd. Cobb. Here. Tuda. Here. Larson. Here. Maddox. Here. Russell. Petrus. Here. I just want the record to show that Davida Russell, uh, Councilwoman, Council Vice President Russell is with her mom at the hospital tonight. Her mom is not doing well. I hope we can all offer her our prayers. Um, so R Russell is excused. Any amendments to the agenda? Hearing none, we'll move on. Approval for the minutes of February 5th. Anybody see anything in the minutes? Okay, the minutes are approved. Uh, the next thing on the agenda, uh, so uh, there was a uh, noble station development that came to council on sept in September of last year, and it was not approved. And then council made a decision to have um, another attempt by TWG developers to come back, and they're in the process of uh, making some changes. Paul Volpe is here and Alex Frazier from TWG, and they're going to do a presentation and show us uh, what they've done so far. And I just want everybody to know where we are. Well, I mean, TWG officials will let you know, but we're, um, we're not voting on this tonight. We're not voting on this this month. We're, we're at least a, a few months away from that. Uh, and is Mr. Volpe in the room? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want to come up and, uh, and we'll get started and we appreciate you coming here and you can tell us about all the work you've been doing for the last few months. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, of course, Alex Frazier with TWG, but I know you all uh, relatively well at this point. Uh, thank you for your time. We really just wanted to give you guys an update as far as what has happened since our contract has been extended. And a lot of changes have been made uh, as far as process and what we've done to, I guess, right our wrongs, if you will, and make this project something special. So the first thing we've done is we've been doing a significant amount of community meetings and focus group meetings. We created a focus group where we've met, I want to say, every other week to just talk about the design, people that are interested in learning more about the design and the project. In addition, we've also kind of recreated our design team. So, of course, we brought on Paul Volpe with our team, uh, as well as Bialoski Cleveland, an architecture group uh, here in town. Um, we're really, I guess, proud with the progress that we've made. I, I think it's something that hopefully the community can be proud of and uh, we've taken a lot of steps towards that. Um, we're not done here and still have a lot to go through. We have been through one preliminary review with Planning Commission. Uh, do plan to go to ABR for initial review this Thursday. Um, but I guess the last thing I'll mention is, you know, I wouldn't like to consider this an extension of our last project. This is a new project just because it's going to look so different than kind of what you've seen before. Uh, so with all that said, I will and hand it off to Paul uh, to talk about the new proposed project and site plan. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having us. We really appreciate this. Um, it means a lot to all of us. Uh, the residents that are here that have uh, devoted an enormous amount of time uh, to the many, 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 this is where we started, by the way, on uh, September 4th when I um, first came here and, um, and it took a month and a half before the real work started, the redesign, as Alex said. And when this is done, we will have had 17 meetings, 15 of which were totally open public meetings. This is the most intense process in my 40 years of practicing architecture and urban design I've ever been through. <laughs> it's like scoring the most points in a basketball game. Um, I got the record. Anyway, it's been really fun and productive and the contributions that the residents have made uh, are remarkable and you're gonna see it. You, it's gonna be self-evident when you see the new building and the new plan. Um, at first, the biggest things that were 
uh, there was concern with, in my mind, my recollection was a concern for low-income housing. And I think that was related particularly to the fact that it was discussed that this was financed through a low-income housing tax credit. Um, the second one was density, too many people on this site. Um, the third one was, um, oh, geez, 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 come on, help me. I had this all in my head, and I'm not choking, I just can't remember. Oh yeah, amenities, we needed amenities, and we needed this project to relate to the district and the neighborhood much more directly. And, um, and, 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 and I think the last thing was the architecture, which was the one that spoke to me, which is why I was first asked to get involved. Anyway, this is where we're at. Yellow is what we're doing tonight. Later this week, we got ABR. And, uh, and in about a month and a half, Hopefully, we're going to be close to applying for building permits with your approval. Um, we have a focus group. It's tremendous. It's the most intense part of this. We will be having our fourth focus group meeting um, in about two weeks. The focus on that will be the site and the landscape design and preparation for the uh, planning commission meeting. Um, and uh, these are the first three meetings. Pretty much the same people, nobody dropped out, um, and uh, just a lot of productive thinking and great ideas. And um, so let's get into the presentation. This is our site. Uh, it is a very strange configuration. Um, it's ziggy and zaggy, and it nothing is pretty much nothing is perpendicular, and we had to figure out how to make this work. But the way the new design works compared to this, the original design, is that the new design adapts to the shape of the site. And that's very important. That's part of what we do as urban designers, is to think about context, think about placemaking, think about resulting spaces, so that the building isn't the primary feature. It's the people, the uses, and the spaces that are created. Um, of course, the parking lot was the dominant feature in this, as well as a 260-foot-long building. We've moved on, brought it to the front of the street, bent it in the middle like an elbow, um, and, and that opened up the whole rear and side of the site. It enabled us to address Noble Road. Uh, we redirected our point of entrance off of Woodview and Noble. Um, we also added amenity spaces, and that's what you see in colors. Uh, the blue is a lobby that's about three times the size of the original lobby where people will congregate. That's a public space. It's an amenity. The red, uh, the one on the far right, is a large room that accommodates 50 people, and, um, and that is the community room for studying, for lectures, for parties, for weddings, whatever this community of people that live here want to use it for. The other one at the apex toward Noble Road uh, was intended to be a learning center, a computer center, for, for particularly kids. Laptops would be there. Hopefully some patriarch uh, will, will provide laptops tops for this, and kids that don't have them will be able to come here and use them. It's a great place to read a newspaper, look out at the street, and just enjoy a very quiet and serene environment. And the green is what I'm going to loosely call retail space. Um, uh, you will see what we have in mind for that, okay? And everything that you see in yellow is residential. This is the current floor plan. Um, what is particularly important is that the entrance, see where it says elevator right in the center? That's dead center of the hallways. That used to be on an end. So we had to walk about 200 plus feet to get to the elevator from the far end. Now it's half the distance. It's planned as it should be planned. Um, this is the upper three floors. Um, and the unit distribution has changed. There were 52 units. Um, the, the aspiration on density was the way to reduce the density was to cut out units, cut out apartments. Uh, we figured out that that was one way to do it, but the other way to do it was to change the mix of apartments, which was a wonderful thing to do because we have to pay for all this extra stuff and the rent's what pays for it. That's what OFA supports. So as we learn about low-income housing tax credit, credits, and, and this is affordable housing, and I'm going to use that from now on because that's exactly what it is. This is not, this is not um, Section 8-type housing. 
Um, we got the same 52 units, which was the maximum we could apply for, but we significantly reduced the density from the original 52. I will tell you now that originally the minimum occupancy was 103, now it's 89. The maximum occupancy was 206, it's now 178. And the kid occupancy maximum was 102 children, now it's 74 but we have the same amount of apartments. So we have a much better mix. This will cater more to young couples, to single folks, to empty nesters like me. Um, there's more one bedrooms, less two bedrooms, and one more three bedroom. Um, it works, it works perfectly from a unit mix. This is the ground level plan. And what you see here in red is what we call the community lease space. The blue up above it, we now call the Internet Cafe. We're still focusing on, on, on the Internet. You can see the lobby with the mailroom, a big leasing office right at the entrance. And on the right side is the community room uh, with an indoor bike storage space. So there's a lot of amenity space that wasn't here before. We added 2,844 square feet. That had to be paid for. That got paid for by... Honestly, very smart design. It got paid for by uh, maintaining the, the, the number of units, uh, reducing the density saves a bit of money because you have less bedrooms and bathrooms and things like that, which are expensive to build. But also we were able to slightly increase the size of the living room in every single unit so that there is more room within the units for people to live their lives to enjoy their lives. And it particularly makes, makes a difference when you got kids. Okay, so here's the site. I'm gonna move quicker now. Um, these are sketches that Planning Commission likes to see. But basically, uh, before we get into architecture, uh, the details of the architecture, this is urban design again. How do you infill a street that's established but has a giant vacant lot like this and have it make sense? So if you look here, um, you can see the view is almost exact to what the perspective shows. That's the true scale of the building. These studies very much influenced the actual design of the building. Um, the, the sequencing of materials, wrapping the corner of the building on the bottom. When you actually get to the lot, you'll hit the retail space. It actually wraps around the corner, which makes it even more enticing as you enter the driveway. When you pull in, the building forms sort of a, an embrace, uh, and the entrance is right at the apex of the two wings. Uh, there's handicap parking and retail parking right there. Uh, this is a view looking west. Uh, the length of this facade is 40% um, shorter than it was in the original design. So the building scale has very much been taken into consideration. And as you will see, it's been broken into smaller chunks um, this is what you'll see from Woodview Road next to that beautiful uh, convenience store. Um, the architecture, and I am moving quick, so if you've got questions, you're welcome to interrupt me. Um, this, is, this is a drawing that I use, and I have many of these, but this one was perfect here because it shows about a two-third, one-third relationship between width and height, which is what we've pretty much achieved. Sometimes it's 50-50, but it's never less than that because verticality is important. More important though, is the fact that buildings over time in urban areas are built up against each other, as you see in this picture. We've taken a very big building and we've broken it into smaller pieces so it feels more urbane. And we tried to change the materials, the colors, the relationship, uh, even the, the articulation of the windows, which are the most dynamic part of the facade, so that we have a building that feels more segmented. These are the elevations of the building. It's very different than it was. And you can see those relationships that, that hint toward the vertical. You can see shade differences, color differences, different materials, different articulations of windows, the way they're ganged, the way they're grouped. Um, it's all very, very important to achieving what you're gonna see in a minute. Um, the windows are, are, are large. Um, they're a three foot by five foot window and in every living room they're ganged like you see on the left. They're not singles like you see in the upper right hand picture. 
Um, in the master bedrooms, every one of them, they've got a double window. So you're looking at something that's about seven feet wide that covers the room. And then in the smaller bedrooms, you have a single one. That gives us the ability to do some wonderful things. And the primary materials in this building are um, uh, a wood finished uh, exterior polymer, uh, polymer channeled siding. Each one has a different profile. It's very important. It's not just the color, it's the texture um, and, the, and, the, uh, and the joinery between the panels. That's our primary accent material. The one in the upper right is a premium vinyl siding. Um, it is commercial grade and uh, it is a lap siding. Um, it's seven inches vertically and it very much fits in the context of the materials that are very in this neighborhood a lot. And the one on the bottom is a fiber cement siding that's three eighths of an inch thick. Uh, as I said in the last meeting, you can hit it with a baseball bat and you'll hurt the bat, not the siding. Um, and, and what it'll do is it makes the bottom 11 feet of the building, because the ground floor is taller, the bottom 11 fill, uh, feet of the building very, very durable, and it's easily cleanable. Um, this is important. Um, and then the range of colors and textures you see on the left, I'm not going to go through this and tell you where everyone is. I'd rather show you. So let's go to the site quickly because one of the great things about this design is that the indoors and the outdoors speak to each other. The whole site's been photographed, our team photographed, and we have three major photo groups. The one that matters the most is photo group number one because that's where all the big trees are. The rest of it is mostly uh, scrub trees, invasive species that need to go, or just trees that are in the way and have to come out, but all of the major species, particularly oaks and maples, here up against the fence in the wall, we wanna keep them. And there's a 10 foot grade, grade change. You can see everything in green is the trees we intend to keep. And uh, from the back of the site, the right side to the front, there's 10 feet of fall. Well, we're using that to our advantage. Um, some really good things are happening about that. The site's gonna be graded and terrace but all those trees will remain. And they, of course, provide screening, shading, and, and a real nice uh, physical sense to the parking lot, which is pulled to the back, but it's not too far from the building. Um, and you should know there's exactly the amount of parking spaces on the site that meets the zoning code. I know some people have talked about parking and they can address that. I will only say that, um, in my opinion, um, this is the right use of this site because it leaves us with the right amount of open space, which is important. And you'll see that in the site plan. When the building sits on the street, it becomes an economic development generator. Um, I've studied with those lines, the myriad of setbacks that exist. We've established a new setback uh, that we would set as a design standards if there were design guidelines. And this is the job of the of the planning department here, but you can see our, our sort of L-shaped building. It's close enough to the street to establish an edge that kind of works with the green buildings and the red buildings. Um, and, uh, and yet, um, it is comfortable enough from the street and far enough back that we can do some really nifty streetscape stuff, um, as you'll see now. Um, here is the site plan. Um, we're working on this in a lot of detail now. Um, it has evolved, but essentially, essentially it's what you see here. Um, and um, you can see all the trees in light green that we're keeping and all the trees in darker green um, that will be new. Um, and, uh, and outdoor spaces are being created. And this is what you're gonna see now. This is really important and then I'll be done. Um, the, along the street, Oh, it doesn't show up on a TV screen. Along the street, you can see the setback, and I'll show you the current design for that. Uh, there'll be tables for outdoor dining and wonderful stuff on Noble Road that we think, with the right public-private partnerships as this has become, um, Noble Road can excel. It can be something wonderful. Um, and, and then you can see the community lease space, the Internet Cafe, face that outdoor space. The lobby faces the entrance. There's another space there. There's a sitting area 
and a place for people to just pop out the door. That is the sunny side of the building. The front side, unfortunately, faces north, so it does not get real good sun. It gets really great shade. Uh, but the sunny side are the two really active private spaces. And the other one is off where it says bike storage community room. That's a very large space. Um, that is the community patio. Um, that's a place where you can walk right out of the community room, have outdoor gatherings. Uh, there'll be a tot lot. Um, there'll be barbecue grills and picnic tables and planting areas and raised beds uh, for seniors to plant vegetables and flowers. And it'll just be a delightful place that's very secured and, and, and very intimate because we like to think of this as a community. When these work, these kind of projects work, there's a sense of community when you're there. Um, and then you can see the entrance driveway, and I won't go through how this works, but it's all designed uh, for safety and for safe crossing to get into the open lawn area that you see, which is where that big grove of trees is. And that's for kids and people just to stroll and walk and have fun. Incidentally, um, the parking lot, um, the slope I talked about, um, the, the um, the site is being terraced in three levels. The highest end will slope down to the driveway. We're gonna put slots in the curbs and where it says garden area, that'll actually have a bioretention swale. We'll be collecting all the storm water. So we won't need any piping to get rid of the water in that big parking lot. And that's the largest surface area. Um, this project has a, a good many sustainable features. Um, the uh, front of the site um, when I show you the design, has got good planter areas, and that entire area will be designed to catch the water as it terraces and go into the large tree planters. So, from the standpoint Paul, of the, just one, one yeah. real quickly. Sure. I, I want to make sure that we have time for questions. What do you think, in a couple Almost more done. minutes? Give me, give me two more minutes. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm just going to end up with, this is what we're after on the street, and that is a rendering of what you'll see of the building on the street. Um, you can see the patios and the street trees and the driveway that comes in. You can see we've rendered in the neighborhood uh, around it. Um, this is uh, what we'd kind of like to see happen. Uh, whether it becomes the lease space, we don't know, uh, but Re Reverend Hicks uh, is very excited about um, initiating this and, and, and the possibility of uh, uh, doing it as a community development corporation venture, which would be a coffee bar and the internet cafe. You can see they're just the right size, outdoor dining, there's the big planners and, uh, and, and the step streetscape. And when you get close, that's how that will feel, uh, which will be lovely. Um, when you turn the corner, you go toward the entrance. Um, this is what you see from a distance. There's no question where you come in and out of this building. Um, and, and we wanna have wonderful garden areas, and I'm just going so quick, but um, and a lot of great things for kids to play on. Things you don't find in traditional urban playgrounds. Uh, you see the bile swale on the lower left? That's what we're gonna have next to the parking lot. And you see the kids playing in it? See the, the little girl climbing on the logs? That's what we're hoping to do, provide new adventures for children. When you get close to this, that's how it'll feel. That's the sitting area, uh, which, which will be great fun to be in. And um, the entire building is handicapped accessible. Um, and I'll end with this slide. Um, this was something that came up at our last meeting. Um, I started thinking about the entrance in this building and I said, boy, wouldn't it be neat on that big three-story panel to do something special? So I came to the community and I said, you know what? I'm very fond of African art. And you can see examples, uh, quilts and tapestries and ceramics, the bright colors, the modern designs. And as this is a neighborhood that is rich with African-American residents, I said, maybe together we can create something. So this is just a version that I created. It's not cast in anything other than hopefully to stir the imagination 
um, of something that would make this building even more memorable than it is. I'm done. I'm finished. Sorry it took so long. I mean, it was a lot, and you did it in, in a relatively short amount of time. And you're getting a round of applause, so. You got a round of applause, so that must have been perfect. I'm happy. <clears throat> okay, I, I certainly would love to hear questions from council members, so let's. Uh, Mr. President. Mr. Petrus. Thank you very much for coming here this evening and sharing this. I noticed that the playground was in a couple different places in the drawings, and so I just want to confirm that it would be placed next to the building. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. The top I think areas, that, no, it's, it's a good question. The top areas are all next to the building. The laser pointer doesn't work on the TV screen, but the area right next to bike storage, that's very large. That's about 65 no. feet by 55 feet. It's very large. And, and the, the, in the upper right-hand corner, is where the tot, tot area where the kids could climb on. The, there is a, um, a crosswalk that goes across. The street becomes one way where that occurs, so it becomes much safer. There's no through traffic in there unless it's a move-in or a delivery truck. Um, so kids can safely cross a narrower road, go into what's called the open lawn area, and that's a place for climbing and jumping and so on and so forth. Great. Thank you. All right. Other questions? Councilwoman Larson. Thank you for your presentation this evening. Um, one of the things that I got a little hung up on on the original plan was the mailbox location. Is it in, going to be inside in the lobby this time? Yes. Thank you. Well, in the lull, I'll ask a question. So how many parking spaces are there? Um, well, there's uh, 52 apartments, and there's one per apartment. Okay. And then based on the zoning code, uh, we're required to have four parking spaces on site for the coffee shop, okay? So that makes 56 parking spaces on site. And then there's a separate loading zone where you can pull off and so forth. Um, the, there's a uh, more than the required amount of uh, handicapped accessible spaces right by the entry. And, and then we're hoping, if you can see the gray line on Noble Road, we're hoping that the city will approve on-street parking, at least on this leg of Noble Road, because it will dramatically help the commercial businesses. And, um, and there would be more parking provided if the city so wisely was to approve that. Okay, so visitors parking would be on the street? No, well, there's two places for visitor parking. One would be on the street, no. And the other one would be the parking lot that is just, I gotta see if I got a picture of it. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, you can't see. See the superwash coin laundry? Yes. I'm sorry, I'll try and get out of the way. Just below that is a 24 space parking lot that the city owns, which is a public lot. Okay. And we thought that was a perfect place for visitors. In addition to a lot of other parking locations, there's probably three times the parking spaces at Save-A-Lot than Save-A-Lot needs. And uh, Save-A-Lot has been extremely cooperative. Reverend Hicks has been, well, I will say, has developed a very good working relationship with the owner of the company who has come to two of our meetings that I've been at. And uh, we're hoping to see uh, some partnerships emerge um, as a result of this investment and that communication. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, we're hoping to, you know, get some communication going uh, with Save-A-Lot and other merchants in the neighborhood. Councilwoman Larson. Yeah, thank you. I would like you to tell us the formula that you described to me the other day for the ADA compliant units, please. You said there was a formula there. Oh, yeah, it's 5%. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I'm looking right and left. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, very comprehensive, a lot to take in, a lot of changes. I I do agree. This is like a new. This is not really as much of a modification it is as it is a new project, and um, I think we saw that today with the presentation. Couldn't have been done without an enthusiastic developer, particularly this guy. I'm serious. Can you go back to the uh, timetable? Sure. Just for a second. So everybody, just so we look at this, um, 
You've got ABR this week. There we go. And <clears throat> then I see that you've been to the Planning Commission for a preliminary, and then you're going to come back on April 10th uh, to the Planning Commission. Yes. Should we, as council, should we be expecting um, a, a, a contract at some point or... Well, that's intended to be discussed, hopefully approved in April 1st, because what council sees is exactly what ABR and the planning commission are gonna see. And the feeling was it was appropriate, most appropriate to show it to this body first before other public boards see it for more technical reasons. And the contract purchase agreement would be brought up at that meeting and you would see the final, which we don't expect to be much different than this, uh, but you would see a, an abbreviated version of any and any revisions to this that might occur. Um, and, um, and, and then after council reviews it, then we would go to uh, the boards uh, who have, will have already seen it. They're gonna see the same thing you're seeing today, uh, only you're seeing it first. And we're maintaining that uh, what should I call it? protocol to have our legislative body review it first, along with obviously the administration is well aware of what we're doing. And, um, and then we take it to the boards and, and they sort of act on it, you know, okay. give us their, their thinking. All right. I'm glad you explained that. Okay. Uh, with nothing further from council, we'll thank you very much. And perhaps we'll see you at one of these other meetings as well. Um, and uh, certainly if anything changes, you know, shoot us an email or anything, you know, we need to be aware of. Okay. Again, appreciate your... Much thanks on our end. Thank appreciate you. the time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> moving on with our agenda, communications from the mayor. Thank you, Mr. President. So first thing I'd like to say, and this is uh, an alert to council members certainly, but to the public generally, is uh, that the Ohio presidential primary is March 19th. Um, early voting has already begun, and so I encourage all of you to make a plan to vote um, if you have not done so already. Um, second, I want to express my gratitude to my staff and to JAPO uh, Cultural Inst Arts Institute um, for an absolutely spectacular Black History Month celebration. Um, if you were not there, I, my condolences. If you, if you were there, uh, thank you for, for coming and I'm looking forward to next year. There was a bit of confusion with the school district this year. Um, we had some competing events going on, on the, at the same time. So I decided that we would have a shuttle that would go from our event to the high school's event um, so that people could experience both. But next year, I'm hoping that we can plan it together and maybe have a joint celebration of Black History Month. Um, and so that was February. I, 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 I did want to express, though, some, some, some sorrow uh, because February also uh, took, took some things away from us, took some people away from us. And so I just want to express my sincere condolences to the families of Carolyn Neal, who was an employee at our senior center, um, at the community center, who, who passed in February, and also to the family and friends of Earlene Starks Marshall, better known as Ms. Duck, um, who was a longtime volunteer at the community center, um, who also passed in February. So I wanted to express my condolences there. Um, and then lastly, uh, there, there's some other things that I'm, I'm going to say for another time. But lastly, I did want to make it a matter of record um, that the RFB that council authorized us going out for um, project, the Monmouth Road project, including uh, CH 9, 32, 57, 58, the SSOs, um, we got bids back, I believe, on the 23rd. Um, and the lowest and best bidder was Fabrizi Trucking and Paving uh, in an amount of $2,296,895.90. Uh, and so I would 
appreciate council's approval at moving forward with that. Or I guess I just need to make it a matter of record. Is that right? And then we'll, we'll come to you with uh, any agreements that we need approved. Um, and beyond that, uh, well, that actually, that concludes my remarks for this evening. Thank you, Mr. President. You're welcome. Mayor, I just want to make sure, did, did we agree that, did you agree that you wanted to talk about the ARPA process or where we're at? Yeah, I've changed my mind. That's okay. going to be an announcement for another time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then let's see, we got uh, communications from uh, the city administrator. Thank you. Uh, anything from any city departments? Okay, report from the clerk of council. Nothing to report. Thank you. Now we're at public comment. Um, this is, we're, so we're gonna do legislative agenda items first and then general public comment. What, what do we have, Addie? Number wise. We have two for agenda and I would say about 12 for non-agenda. Okay, all right, fire away. First up is Fran Mench. Fran, you know the drill, you have uh, three minutes and uh, please say, everybody say your name and uh, the street you live on. My name's Fran Mench, I live at 3060 Chelsea. I'd like to comment on the zoning proposal for the houses of worship. Um, my question is, will these properties then become tax exempt? Um, I think that, that that appears to be where it will be going. Um, also the size of these uh, buildings are allowed to be up to 10,000 square feet. That's a pretty large um, building. I also um, am concerned that the vacant buildings that we have already in the city be utilized um, and encourage that you encourage people to use them uh, for places of worship other than, you know, as I say, taking more properties off the tax rolls. Um, my other concern is that it is the documents that you got to look at included the statement that it should be passed as an emergency. And the rationale for that was that there's at least one pending case before the Planning Commission that would be impacted positively by passage of the legislation. Um, however, I looked and I saw no pending case. I looked for the past three months. I saw no case that had to do, maybe I, do, I don't, don't understand what I'm seeing or it's not there, but I see nothing that we, um, has to do with houses of worship. So once again, uh, citizens have voiced previously they're, discon they're being disconcerted that legislation is passed as an emergency. And one thing that that does is it prevents ever the citizens ever bringing a referendum. And then um, the other thing is that it appears that if you pass that, it will, you're gonna have a public hearing later, but there'll be no point in citizens participating in the public hearing if you've already passed the legislation. Thank you. Oh, no. Oh. Also, well, anyway. okay, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, go ahead. Diane Hallam. And while Diane's coming up, um, I would just say that the, that p particular piece of legislation that Fran Mensch referred to has been referred to the planning committee uh, for discussion. And so there will be um, you know, that question that you asked about the tax exempt status, and I would assume several other questions will also be asked at that time. And, and although we don't have the meeting scheduled right now, please look for that um, because it will be scheduled uh, probably within the month. No, no, sure. Okay, Diane Hallam, Oxford Road. Uh, to follow up on the agenda item for uh, Community Development Week. Um, because the TWG issue arose because uh, the community was kind of excluded from being a participant. And so now I'm writing my actual statement. Uh, I encourage everyone to read the article in the latest Heights Observer about Noble Action Group an organization through which noble area residents are mobilizing to speak out and ensure resident participation in the city's Noble Road Corridor comprehensive planning study. Our objective is to revitalize the Noble Road community to provide the quality of life we deserve, want, and is described in the city's master plan that includes well-maintained streets, sidewalks, businesses, apartment buildings, numerous retail shops, green spaces, and recreation, currently none of which we have. Our goal is also to ensure this new effort by the mayor 
uh, in his plan uh, or study is not a repeat of the abuses, neglect, and exclusion of Noble Road residents of past administrations when they too claimed they were here to improve things. And each and every past effort, res residents were ignored and barred from having participation in the actual planning, with the end result being the actual diversion of city resources of funds away from the Noble Road and its needs. All of us looked hopefully towards the new effort that was proposed by the mayor. He says this will be data driven and its purpose is to get input from residents about the strengths, opportunities and challenges, particularly from the perspective of its residents. Our first study module about problem properties last Tuesday at the Oxford Elementary School, or was at, um, however, city staff certainly was not interested in the perspective of residents or in accurate data. Um, anyone driving down Noble Road agrees the problem properties along its corridor are the unkempt, ill-maintained, and vacant commercial structures and apartment buildings. Turns out city staff and the administration categorized problem properties as the houses that we, the majority of those present at that meeting, had, you know, lovingly owned for 20 years. Um, the, um, oddly, also, staff believes, or at least claims, uh, in his presentation, the average market value of houses in my neighborhood are $120,719 or $120,830, according to his presentation. Uh, from our perspective, residents here know that's just plain wrong. Uh, the fact is it's wrong by 35%. Uh, my visit to the county's recorder's website reveals the average market value in uh, Noble, between Noble and Monticello, stretching from Selwyn to Noble's Monticello, Monticello intersection is $75,310.72, and I can provide the spreadsheet. That's 35% error in what the city uses and what is actually going on. All right, thank you, Ms. Hallam. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna go on to uh, non-legislative items. CJ Nash. Hello, CJ Nash, Vandemar Street. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments on the Pandora's box that we've been dealing with now since October. As everybody knows, we you know came out in favor of you know in support of the Jewish community and what they went through. We failed to foresee the the repercussions of that because none of us has a crystal ball. Now we have a problem because we have a part of our community that is, that really needs, I mean, in my opinion, needs an apology because we've left them out and they're being hurt also. Personally, I believe that we can support both communities. My hope is that in the future, we will not make any more of these resolutions because we're a small city. These resolutions may make us feel good, but they don't further the cause. We don't have any power to affect what's going on in the international community. I know that people are involved in this emotionally and that is understandable. Definitely are, but when we write to our our uh, you know our, our leadership here in Cleveland Heights, when we want you guys to come out with resolutions saying we support this, we support that, we support that, what's the end result of that? Our support in this city that you guys designate does not make a difference over there it seems it would be a better use of time if people would send these emails to our uh, federal politicians, our senators and our representatives, because they do have the power to make choices. Unless there's something I don't know, and I don't know a lot, you guys are not privy to uh, top secret threat briefings for the nation. So when it comes to international politics, I think that there needs to be a better way to show that we care about our residents, that we care about the pain that people are going through. 
without stating specific resolutions that put us in the situation that we're in right now because those type of resolutions don't help us at all, but they do cause us a lot of problems. Thank you. Jody Serini. Good evening. My name is Jody Serini, and I'm president of the Board of Education of the Cleveland Heights University Heights City Schools. And I also live at 2260 Fenwick Road in University Heights. I'm here tonight because I wanted to personally thank you for passing the legislation to allocate funds to pay for the lifeguards at the Heights High pool so the community can swim when the pool is not being used by our students. And I'm really sorry we weren't here on February 20th, the night you guys uh, discussed this legislation, but we had our own meeting that night, so we were a little busy. This legis legislation is an important component to enable the pool to reopen for community swim. Even though she's unable to be here this evening, I'd like to publicly thank Vice President of Council Davida Russell for sponsoring this legislation. And I'd also like to thank both Davida Russell and President of Council Tony Kuda for their many phone calls to me this year to discuss this legislation, as well as their conversations last year regarding the pool with former school board member Jim Posh. During the months it took to craft the legislation, both Davida and Tony took the time to listen and understand that while the Board of Education wants the pool open for the community, it is unlawful for public school districts to fund community recreation programs. So with this legislation in place, there should be ample time for the city and the school district to arrange details so we can get the pool open to the public, hopefully in the fall. We look forward to working as partners with the city for the good of our community. And thank you again for passing this legislation. Andrea Doe, Poe, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Wait, let me make sure this is, okay. Okay, good evening everyone. I'm Andrea, I live on 2733 Hampshire Road. I'm a Case alum and a Cleveland Heights resident of four years. Three days from now will mark five months of Israel's brutal attack on Gaza, and on this fourth day of Women's History Month, I can't help but ask, which women matter to you all? As a black Muslim woman in Cleveland Heights, I've often felt comfortable in my identity amidst the vibrant religious backdrop of practicing Muslims and the Orthodox Jewish community here. This feeling only shifted in October. Oftentimes in war, women face the brunt of atrocity on both sides as rape, sexual violence, and children are used as its weapons. But this is not a war, this is a genocide. On October 7th, Israelis appealed to Western sympathy for Israeli women assaulted by Hamas. But over 75 years of occupation, how many Palestinian women have been assaulted, raped, tortured in Israeli custody and openly in the streets? How many Muslim women have been stripped of their dignity and searched, miscarried under bomb fire, and had their children stolen from them just to find out they are being raised and re-socialized into Israeli homes? Miscarriage has gone up 300% in Gaza due to this. So I ask, which women matter? I can't help but think that I would not top that list. Amongst the suffragists, feminists, and revolutionaries so celebrated this month, I'm reminded that many of them harbored racist views. Much of the push for the women's vote came out of a fear verbalized by Susan B. Anthony when she said, I will cut off this right arm of mine before I will ever work or demand the ballot for the Negro that is the black man and not the woman that is white women. As a black woman, I've often felt like an oxymoron. As a Muslim convert, like an outsider. As I, under a liberal feminist and American gaze, would be labeled oppressed, some going as far as to, to support the destruction of Palestine, of my people, because it would free us Muslim women from the so-called oppression of the barbaric Arab Muslim man. If any of you cares about women in Cleveland Heights and the safety of all women everywhere, pass the ceasefire resolution. Thank you.
Melissa Wood. My name is Melissa Wood. Uh, I live on Cottage Grove. I'd like to say first, in response to after watching your Committee of the Whole meeting, that Palestinians in Gaza are not starving. They're being starved. They are not dying. They are being massacred using American weapons. They are not receiving humanitarian aid because Israel is blocking the trucks at the border. And when one gets in, the IDF fires on it and we have the Flower Day massacre. That is why they are not getting humanitarian aid, because Israel is not allowing it. This issue is divisive and complicated in the way that American slavery was divisive and complicated in the way that the Holocaust was divisive and complicated in the way that the genocide of Native Americans was divisive and complicated. There were many people on, in support of all of those things. Luckily, luckily they came to an end. They came to an end through struggle. And they came to an end through war. I'd like to tell you a little story very quickly. In 2019, I, as a member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee of the Cleveland Heights School District and a parent, organized a Palestinian speaker to come to speak after school. It was signed off on by the administration. I spoke with uh, teachers, students. There was interest. It was an after school event. The night before it happened, I got a call from the Cleveland Jewish News. And they said that the Orthodox community would be there to basically disrupt and possibly picket. Um, the problem was that in the flyer, the word Israel existed in the same sentence as colonialism. The total title was bringing, putting Palestine back on the map. I was pressed to cancel this speaker. So the Cleveland Heights students did not get to learn about the history of Palestine. Because a vocal minority in this community that does not use our public schools and does not vote for our levies decided that they did not want our students in, <laughs> in Cleveland Heights High School to learn true history. So if you guys stand for against all the, all the uh, horrible, obnoxious, racist uh, actions of our, of, our, of our state legislature, what's happening in Florida and Texas, then you should be for teaching history and for standing with the oppressed. Thank you. Susan Wood. My name is Susan Wood, I live at 2515 Edge Hill Road. I was all prepared to come a month ago. I had a nice, neat little thing to speak about, um, but I listened to the Committee of the Whole this evening, and uh, all I can say is, why was it the role of City Council to come out on behalf of Israel? when you did. You were just asking for this. What the hell were you thinking? Anyway, if you continue on all that, you will be on the wrong side of history, all of you, except Mr. Maddox, possibly. Anyway, to start again, my name is Susan Wood. I live at 2515 Edge Hill Road, and I am a lifelong resident of Cleveland Heights. You may have passed my house, which has two large handmade wooden signs on the front lawn. We stand with black lives 
and cease fire now, stop the genocide. One has been there since the weekend George Floyd was murdered and the latter went up in October, shortly after this horrible war paid for by my tax dollars started. I am a Jew confirmed at Silver's Temple in the early 60s. My father's family immigrated from Russia in, 19, in 1898. I'm not ignorant of anti-Semitism and its effects. I'm also not ignorant of the history of the Jewish state of Israel and the fate of Palestinians for the last hundred years. The, the, the Palestinians who had and have as much right to the land in Palestine as the Jews. I am asking you to pass this resolution in support of the people of Gaza and Palestine, the people in Gaza who are dying in hideous numbers and circumstances. You passed a resolution standing with the Jewish community of Cleveland Heights, and now you need to pass another one, standing with the Palestinians and those of us who care for them. If you have a moral compass, please exercise it. And I'm, I will leave you with the words of David Ben-Gurion. He's the primary founder of the State of Israel and Israel's first prime minister. If I were an Arab leader, I would never sign an agreement with Israel. It is normal. We have taken their country. It is true God promised it to us, but how could that interest them? Our God is not theirs. There has been anti-Semitism, the Nazis, Hitler, Auschwitz, but was that their fault? They see but one thing. We have come and stolen their country. Why would they accept that? David Ben-Gurion. Christopher Wood. This seems to be a family affair. <clears throat> My name is Christopher Wood. I've lived in Cleveland Heights for 70 years. Um, speakers opposing a defense of Palestinian children, um, a Zionist group that was here in numbers previously, but obviously they feel that they have won this particular battle. Those speakers opposing the defense of Palestinian children have reminded us that the US bombed the defenseless civilians of Dresden and Hiroshima in 1968, American soldiers raped and murdered 500 women and children and the elderly at a village in Vietnam called My Lai. No one was ever punished. We should never forget that these atrocities were committed in our name. <clears throat> On October the 18th, President Biden warned Israel not to make the mistakes that we made after 9-11. He was presumably referring to our killing more than 60,000 Iraqi civilians from 2004 to 2009. Those are US Army figures. For no reason whatsoever. A bit later, he said that Iran was responsible for the deaths of three American soldiers because it, it had supplied the weapons. Well, the US has supplied the bombs raining down on women and children in Gaza, making us collectively responsible for their deaths. It is our responsibility as American citizens to try to stop this horrific killing. All over this country, people are calling for a ceasefire. Polls show that the majority of Americans favor it. City councils across the country are issuing resolutions, and recently 1,000 black pastors issued a call, not only for a ceasefire, but for an end to the occupation of the West Bank. Let us here in Cleveland Heights add our collective voice to the call growing around the world for an end to the killing of innocents in Gaza. And I'd like to end by commending Councilman Anthony Maddox for exposing the cowardice and hypocrisy of our mayor and city council. Drew Herzig. Drew Herzig, Bradford Road, Cleveland Heights. Councilors, Mr. Mayor, 
Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, in the end, will we, remember, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Black History Month is just over. Black History Month never stops. On September 15, 1963, in Birmingham, Alabama, four black girls were killed by a bomb planted in their church by white terrorists. I wonder if that happened today. Would you condemn such an action? Or would you say it didn't happen in Cleveland Heights? We have nothing to say to it. Would you say it's not about potholes? We have nothing to say to it. Would you say if we condemn the killing of black girls, it might offend our white constituents? It would be divisive. Would you have nothing to say to it? Four dead children and you would be silent, possibly. Let's double that number. Make it eight dead children. Would you speak up? Double that. Sixteen dead children. Are you still silent? Let's multiply that by a thousand. And that's a low estimate of the children killed in Gaza, dismembered by bombs, mutilated, scarred for life, mentally and physically, reduced to orphans, and you're choosing silence? How will you live with yourselves after that? And you're choosing silence once but not twice because you were not being consistent. You spoke out, you took sides, you divided this community. And now you are deciding that you just can't be bothered with it. Don't hide behind the city limits. At your last meeting, I spoke in favor of a motion protecting the rights of trans families through the whole state of Ohio, and I commend the council on doing that. So don't pretend that you only have to stop at the city limits. Your influence goes farther than you think. That's part of being a moral human being. Speaking of which, I also want to commend Councillor Maddox for standing in truth, his sole force in the true Ghanaian sense. He refuses to cooperate with injustice. I wish more councillors had his moral courage. You have a resolution in front of you that is not divisive, that does not take sides, that does not cast blame, that does not ask you to retract any statement or apologize for any of it. It simply asks you to go to where the United States currently is in saying a ceasefire will save the lives of thousands of innocent women and children in Gaza and that diplomacy is the only way forward in this issue. So we are asking you to stand with the United States in supporting this resolution. And for some reason, for some reason, I just don't understand it. I don't understand how you will go home. There is moral blood on your hands. How could you, how could you stay silent? Thousands and thousands of dead children, children who are being starved, actively starved, as some person said, not just some kind of crop failure, but it's like act actively starved. The, the photos of little shriveled bodies online are horrific and to deny that you have any moral culpability when you spoke out once and refused to speak again, I, uh, I just, I, uh, I hate to shame people. I, I do hate that, but it is shameful. Your silence is shameful. Good night. Fran Mensch. Fran Mensch. Mench, Chelsea Road. Um, I have a question about the Ascent, which is the apartment um, and small retail area that, that was built by at the top of Cedar Hill, corner of uh, Cedar Hill and Euclid Heights. Um, my question is, can we have a report on the occupancy rate of that property? The um, word on the street is that many students are renting and they are um, signing short-term leases, not long-term leases. And of course, students probably pay absolutely no city income tax. Um, so um, I'm concerned about the length of the lease, the occupancy rate, and what kind of even, or revenue we are getting. Um, residents provided and the city provided a great deal of financial support in cash in the form of a TIF um, and other parts of the development agreement. Please provide a report to the citizens as to what revenue this project has generated and the projections of future revenue. Thank you. Before you call the next person, uh, usually our clerk gets back to people who ask questions of the administration. What I don't know is if the administration has this type of data. Is that a question? Yes. All right, so we'd have to get back to you on that. No, we don't normally keep that kind of private data from, um, you know, property owners. Uh, we can we can take a look um, and see sort of what they're. We can we can ask them for that kind of data. Uh, I mean, we we 
generally tend to keep um, occupancy permit data as things change. That's changed a little bit over the course of um, my tenure on council. The lead uh, safe legislation changed it as well, so we can take a look and see what data we actually do have. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to the law director to get back to you on that. Thank you. Scott Watcher. Uh, Scott Walker, Edgerton Road. I'm in University Heights. Uh, two weeks ago, I um, stood before you asking for the passage of the legislation to provide money for the lifeguards for the Cleveland Heights High Pool. And though I know there was absolutely sincere concern about the, the vetting of that particular legislation, I do want to thank Council for, for its passage. And I, and being strictly myopic, I have to tell you, I'm, I am uh, greatly, greatly uh, appreciate what you guys did. Um, I just hope that now that the council has approved this money, that it is eventually does get to the lifeguards so that the pool can open sooner than later and that it's not held up by any uh, um, circumstances. I know it was rejected by emergency, um, but again, I, I, I believe that after 30 days that money could, could go on. So again, I want to just thank council and show my appreciation. I know it was... Uh, it was thought out with a lot of uh, care and deliberation, and hopefully we can get people to start using that pool um, sooner than later, like I said, and also uh, through the fall, winter, and spring of next year as well. Thank you very much. Christine Puxi Ewan. Sitting for a long time back there. <laughs> um, good evening. I'm Christine Puxiu, an executive director of Future Heights, a nonprofit community development corporation serving Cleveland Heights. I have provided a full statement and documentation to the clerk, and so I'm going to deliver a, a pared down version so that I can keep in my time. Most of us have seen communities that are successful in preserving their precious housing stock, and frankly, the ones who don't. It makes a difference to the local economy, the schools, and quality of life. My hope is that Cleveland Heights doesn't fall further behind and makes preserving our housing a priority. Currently, Cleveland Heights owns 16 properties with residential structures. Six of these houses have been owned by the city for five to over six years, five of them for over two years, and the remaining for at least a year. All these properties are distressed and mostly vacant. A handful of these properties are occupied, potentially making our city a landlord of properties that are not meeting housing and building codes. Future Heights launched the Future Homes Program in 2019 specifically to partner with Cleveland Heights to rehab distressed and undesirable homes that they owned. Future Heights completed all houses that were provided by the city, and currently we are finishing house number 21 and 22. These properties will be required to be owner-occupied. Future Heights has a proven record of rehabbing unwanted, distressed, vacant houses and making them productive again. And we have demonstrated over the last year that we have a team in place that can do so much more. So much more, in fact, that along with rehabbing houses transferred to us from the city, we have received ARPA funding so that we may acquire property in the areas we are working in so that we are just not rehabbing a house, we are rehabbing a neighborhood. Yet for months, only to receive, we, yet for months, Future Heights has asked for more houses owned by the city to rehab only to receive conflicting answers or no answers. Um, and I have heard that the administration is not releasing homes for rehabilitation as they want to wait for the Community Investment Corporation to become reorganized. And I say reorganized because the current CIC was created in 2019. This is the same year that Future Heights launched our Future Homes Program. We are finishing up our second, our, our 22nd house, but it is unclear to me how many rehabs the CIC has completed in this time. If the CIC hasn't been functioning in all this time, how long will it be until it is able to function? Meanwhile, the housing stock is continuing to deteriorate when it doesn't have to. 
Why can't Future Heights continue the work that needs to be done while the CIC is figuring out how to operate? We are ready now to move forward with all of these properties. Non-action or a promise of action in an unknown time in the future is not making housing in Cleveland Heights a priority. Tonight, Future Heights respectfully is asking council to work with the mayor to authorize his administration to release homes to CDCs that serve Cleveland Heights. No public hearing is required. We've already passed enabling legislation that allows yeah. for the transfer of properties now, as in the last five years. Steen, we, we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. Okay. Um, my last, very last sentence is, let's work together to get those houses out of the land bank and into the hands of new owners who choose Cleveland Heights as their home. Thank you very much. Matthew Haberbush. Hello. My name is Matt Haberbush. I live on Belfield Avenue. I've been a resident of Cleveland Heights for four years. Um, thank you for your discussion on the language of the two potential proposals um, calling for a ceasefire and human uh, humanitarian aid in Gaza at the Committee of the Whole. I listened to it on my way home, um, the live stream. It provides us with a lot of clarity about where you're at, and I, I'm genuine. I'm, I'm glad that you discussed uh, this. and. Um, I read both, and I think they're both good enough. Um, I would be very happy if they had passed tonight, or at least you know left the um, committee. Um, but I'm glad that you're considering edits, and um, I do think that um, if either, either of them had passed, um, it would contribute to reducing the killings in Gaza and Israel. Um, I think it does have like a major effect, um, and I'm glad that other cities are doing this. Um, please focus though on reducing harm rather than um, worrying about um, whether or not something is decisive. Um, I respect my neighbors who are um, asking you not to pass this resolution, um, but I don't respect any opinion um, less than calling for a ceasefire. Um, two weeks ago, I shared a shorter resolution uh, passed by Toledo, and I hope that maybe something like that could be passed. Um, and uh, I was hoping that um, I guess I hope in the future that you'll come together and create a resolution. Um, this effort was like great in the right direction, but not good enough for me personally. And um, I promise to do the work uh, with you and with my neighbors to try to get this resolution passed. Um, I hope that the next committee of the whole you have ceasefire uh, like language ready to go and that you'll come together and pass one as soon as possible. Thank you. Go Bushwald Gels. I'm sorry if I pronounced that very wrong. A question first. I'm here ignorant. Is there a copy of this resolution that is on the floor? Online. We don't have them uh, printed copies, but they are online. So, okay, I'm speaking to a resolution that I don't know exactly what's in. Um, but I assume it calls for an immediate ceasefire. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of that, so with one major reservation, and it depends what's actually in the wording. I'm Jewish, and I certainly do think that Israel has a right to defend itself to retaliate after the horrendous attacks of October 7th. But one, enough is enough. 30,000 deaths is very hard to wrap my head around, especially with almost half of them being children. Two, there is no way that Israel can achieve the, quote, total victory that many Israelis yearn for. In the 21st century, wars do not end that way. Three, the reality is that there are two peoples who live on the land, neither is going anywhere. The sooner we can stop the killing and start figuring out how to share the land, the better. It will not look like October 6th. I know that we don't get to decide anything here. It's, if, if Cleveland Heights City Council votes this, it's a small voice, but I think we should add our voice to people doing this. Lastly, my reservation, and it's a reservation because I haven't seen it, so I don't know if it uses the word genocide. 
If it does, I wish it could be dropped from the resolution. It's a big word that's getting thrown around a lot these days, genocide. It's what happened to Armenians at the turn of the 20th century, to the Herero people of South Africa, South, Southwest Africa at the same time, to my people a generation later. What Israel is doing is horrendous, but it is not genocide. If the Israeli government wanted to wipe out two million Gazans, they have the bombs to do it. But that's not what they're doing. Instead, I think what the Israeli regime is doing is trying to make Gaza uninhabitable, hoping to drive out those two million people. That is also not going to happen. But as long as this war continues, we just dig our hole ever deeper. So I urge you to pass this resolution. And if it has the word genocide in it, I urge you to drop that word. Thank you. Alicia Kaminsky. My name is Alicia Kaminsky. I live at T410 uh, Blanch Avenue. Um, Jewish is probably good to figure out. And um, if the council wouldn't mind, I would Are just try to. If the council wouldn't mind, I would try to visualize real quick uh, what we're talking about right now. Would we okay? Um, imagine that I'm just taking the hammer right now, going to uh, President Tony Kuda and just start knocking on his head like nonstop. And then at some point he finds some stick probably too and tries to defend himself. And then the rest of the council members gonna start screaming, hey Tony, stop, stop fighting him, stop. Will it make any sense to anyone? Uh, so I, I, the all the result Proposals for resolution uh, technically call Israel to cease fire. Um, I do not understand why no one calls um, the ones who started it to cease fire because Israel was in ceasefire. What happened? The ceasefire was broken uh, by Hamas, and um, uh, it, it, it doesn't make sense for you. For, you want to scream at Tony to stop fighting with me if I'm keep, if I keep hitting his head? Make sense? So uh, this is uh, one thing. Another thing, um, speaking of uh, genocide, um, all the time, uh, so to say, Gaza behaved in, uh, say, good manner, so to say. Israel would allow the better they behave, Israel would allow more people to come and work in Israel. Um, there are, what is it called, so there are plenty Israeli, Muslim, Arabs, leave work, uh, doctors, whoever you want in Israel. Um, I don't believe that would happen in a state that try to uh, kill all Muslim Arabs or Arabs in general, whatever. Um, so um, that point also doesn't seem to be um, applicable. Um, another thing is, um, if we would stop, if Israel would technically stop um, the uh, fighting right now, just stop shooting at Gaza, that's it, we're done. We're out uh, out of the border of the Gaza and we're not doing anything. What do you think, it, where is going to lead? What's going to happen? Technically, you say, uh, Hamas, okay, guys, you got a present today. You can keep um, uh, getting back on your feet, uh, accumulating more weapons and uh, repeat all over again. So if we're screaming about Israelis uh, kill uh, civilians, by the way, don't forget, civilians, so-called so civilians, Gazans, technically they are uh, part of the system who teach their kids that their life in goal is um, uh, to, be, uh, to, to do jihad and uh, um, die by killing uh, Jews. And so this is what, they, what the kids learn from this as soon as they born. And uh, until all this changed, all this system taken out of there and it's been changed, um, it's technically, um, it's just gonna repeat itself all and all again. Unfortunately, your time is up, but oh, thank you so much. Okay. That's all we have. That's it? Okay. Um, just so everybody knows, I, I don't know who was in the committee of the hall, but we did discuss two resolutions. Uh, there were not moved forward. Uh, Councilwoman Gail Larson has uh, offered to put something forward in our next meeting on the 18th. So that's the next time we'll, uh, at least 
uh, that as our intention right now. Uh, we're gonna move to first readings uh, for consideration of adopted. Uh, Addie? I have resolution number 027-2024 on first reading, a resolution procl proclaiming April 1st through April 5th, 2024 to be National Community Development Week and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. I have a motion. Second. second. All right, it's been motion and seconded. Any uh, discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, next resolution. Next, I have resolution number 028-2024 on first reading, a resolution supporting and authorizing the mayor to submit an application to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Recreational Trails Program for a grant under the program and to accept funding if awarded and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. Motion. So moved. <clears throat> All right, it's been motion and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I have resolution number 030-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Inveris Training Solutions, Inc. to make the public improvement of upgrading and or replacing the existing targeting system used to train Department of Public Safety, Division of Police Personnel, and Police Academy cadets and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure. Introduced by Mayor Saren. Motion, please. So moved. Second. I have a second. Motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I have resolution number 032-2024 on first reading, a resolution reappointing Ira Etta Black and Peter DeGolia as members of the Commission on Aging of the City of Cleveland Heights, Ohio, and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Council Member Cobb. Okay. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes. Now we're moving on to first readings only. I have ordinance number 029-2024 on first reading, an ordinance declaring improvements to certain parcels within the city of Cleveland Heights to be a public person purpose, exempting the improvements to such parcels from real property taxation for a period of 30 years, requiring the owners of such parcels to make service payments in lieu of taxes, establishing an urban redevelopment tax increment equivalent fund for the de uh, deposit of such payments, and approving a school compensation agreement with the Cleveland Heights University Heights School District, all pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Sections 5709.41, 5709.42, and 5079.43, and declare the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure. Next, I have ordinance number 031-2024 on first reading, <clears throat> an ordinance introducing amendments to various sections of part 11 zoning code of the codified ordinances of the city of Cleveland Heights to update the city's uh, regulations regulations regarding places of worship and transmitting the same to the planning commission and declaring the necessity that this legislation becomes immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. Mr. President. Yeah. Um, you know what? I, I, let, first, let me just say that I made a mistake uh, earlier. I said this was going to be referred to planning committee. It is going to be referred to the planning commission. Go ahead. Mr. President, I'd like to motion to refer ordinance 031-2024 to the planning commission. All right, any discussion? All right, hearing none, all. President. Yes. Uh, it, it, the codified ordinances provide that the uh, referral needs to be for a period of at least 30 days, but not more than 60 days unless it's later extended. So I would uh, throw a, a time period into your referral motion. Okay, did you get that? Mr. President, could I retract my motion? You may. Mr. President, I'd like to motion to refer ordinance 031-2024 to the plan commission for a period of at least 30 days, but no more than 60 days. Second. Perfect. It's been motioned and seconded. Now, is there any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion passes. Eddie? 
I apologize. I have resolution number 033-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing an agreement with Roper Lockbox LLC for lockboxes to support a senior residential lockbox program, which permits the Cleveland Heights Fire Department access to provide emergency services to Cleveland Heights senior residents, introduced by Mayor Saren. And that has been referred to the Health and Safety Committee. Uh, next, I have resolution number 034-2024 on mm -hmm. first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Valley Freightliner, Inc. for the acquisition of a Freightliner 114SD plus tandem axle cab and chassis for the Department of Public Works, introduced by Mayor Saren. Next, I have resolution number 035-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Valley Freightliners, Inc. for the acquisition of two Freightliner 11SD plus semi-tractors for the Department of Public Works, also introduced by Mayor Saren. Finally, I have resolution number 036-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Gledhill Road Machinery Company for the acquisition of a 14-foot stainless steel dump body and salt, with salt spreader and plow package for the Department of Public Works, introduced by Mayor Saren. Wonderful. Okay, well, next we have committee reports. That ends the legislation. Any committee reports? Thank you, Mr. President. This is just to let the community know that we are scheduling a uh, committee meeting for our Parks and Recreation Committee. And so that will be coming up and the announcement will be made by the next council meeting. There's a couple of projects that I'm working on with the administration and some things that I want to share with that committee. So as we work on that date, I'll make sure that that goes out. So please pay attention online because it may be prior to the next council meeting uh, to make sure that we get these things in on the agenda. That's all I have. Thank you. <coughs> Councilwoman Boyd. Thank you. Um, as uh, you've heard, resolution number 033-2024 uh, was referred to public safety and health. Um, this lockbox program for seniors, I think, will be very um, appreciated and, and favored by council. So our hearing will be very informative more than anything else, just to get the word out for the community about the program. Any um, additional access to uh, for our first responders that we can provide for seniors, I think everyone will be in favor of. And um, I was able to speak with our mayor about that uh, prior to our meeting tonight. So I just wanted to let everybody know, look for that, it'll happen in the next couple weeks. And again, it'll be more informative than anything else we expect it to pass. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, yes. at the request of the mayor and Council President Kuda, the Housing and Building Committee met at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, February 27th. Mr. Zamf, the Director of Planning and Development, Mr. Butler, the Director of Housing, and Mr. Hanna, the Director of Law, joined us. We spent two hours working through the current version of President Kuda's short-term rental legislation and incorporating feedback from the administration. After the Law Department can review additional comments from the Planning and Development Department, we are going to meet again later this month. Also, as some may have heard, the Western Reserve Land Conservancy is doing a survey in Cleveland of Cleveland Heights properties. I asked Director Zanf if it would be possible for members of the Housing and Building Committee to join pro property surveyors. Mr. Zanf kindly agreed, so we are working with Mr. Butler to arrange that. Finally, as a reminder, the Housing and Building Committee meets at 5 p.m. on the second Tuesday of the month. This means that the committee's next regularly scheduled meeting is at 5 p.m. on March uh, 12th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Larson. Thank you, President Akuda. Municipal Services and Environmental Sustainability Committee report, I'm grateful to the citizens who applied for the two new council committees. Um, it's just been a very interesting process for us to go through and people have definitely stepped up to become engaged. Transportation, Mobility and Climate and Environmental Sustainability Committees, hopefully they can convene soon to begin to tackle missions of each group. We'll have a meeting of the Municipal Services and Environmental Services, excuse me, Municipal Services and Environmental Sustainability Committee on March 18th at 10 a.m. I am meeting with the mayor on March 14th regarding potential initiatives that could lead to legislation that this committee could support. Additionally, the Finance Committee has been assigned to review the excise tax portions of the proposed short-term rental legislation. We will meet at 5 p.m. March 18th and I'll be asking the administration to join us for this finance discussion on the excise tax process for this legislation. Thank, Thank you. 
Councilman Cobb. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, last Monday, the Administrative Services Committee met to discuss uh, vacancies and applicants that we have on several of our uh, committees and boards. And it is our hope that uh, Council will begin to make some appointments um, starting at our next meeting. Uh, again, if you have any interest in applying to any of the boards, I would uh, uh, ask that you go to the uh, city's website uh, and apply. Um, the mayor is specifically looking for applicants for a number of committees, so um, please uh, go and apply if you're interested. Uh, we have um, one vacancy that just occurred on our um, landmark commission, which is a seven which is a seven member board that is uh, charged with um, designating historic landmarks in the city and uh, taking steps to preserve those landmarks. Uh, the requirement for appointment to that board is uh, uh, having been a resident of the city for five years and then having some expertise uh, in architecture, history, historic preservation, law, real estate, archeology, span art history, planning, or related uh, discipline. So we have one vacancy, so I encourage you to go to the website and apply if you uh, meet those qualifications. I have nothing further to report. Thank you. Uh, next, we move on to ye old business. Anything from anybody? New business. No new business. Um, next is my report. Let me see if I... Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll just say this. Um, I'm old enough, as, as many of you are in the room, to have seen how the Vietnam War tore this country apart. Um, years later, our country was brutally attacked on 9-11. And we seem to come together, uh, albeit for a short time, uh, in our grief of nearly 3,000 people who died at the hands of terrorists. Uh, who attacked us. Um, one thing that's painfully obvious, we, we just, as human beings, we, we just uh, do not seem to have figured out a damn thing about how we settle our differences um, peacefully. And um, for that, I'm truly sorry. Uh, we, we do try, and we have the United Nations, we have... Uh, the International Court, uh, endless peace talks, we, we, we try, uh, and we, we do need to keep trying. Um, I, I wanna thank all the people who wrote emails and spoke tonight. Um, you all spoke in your own ways very eloquently, and um, thank you for trying, trying to make uh, this world a better place. Uh, I appreciate it. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>